Life in the trenches of World War I could be entirely overwhelming. Living outside for weeks upon weeks, a constant roar of defending artillery, and witnessing a landscape demolished into rubble and mud. At the war's end in 1918, Britain would report shell shock to the tune of 80,000 cases. Yet so much of this trauma would be formed by the day in and day out of war, not the brutality of combat. Be it living in the trenches, the illness it could inflict, the threat of the chemist's war, or the less than ideal rest time. Those soldiers could find glimpses of reprieve, mainly through communication and the kindness of others. Like a sculptor who began constructing prosthetic masks for soldiers disfigured in combat. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the dark history of soldiers during World War I. The Great War, in majority, holds one clear horrific staple of imagery, the trenches. It had been said that these deep, mud-filled, ever-growing networks burrowing through the European countryside even had their own characteristic mud. Diaries have been uncovered of soldiers in World War I, describing the mud found in trenches as unique, even macabre, that would physically suck a soldier further down into the trench. Novels covering the grim conditions of trench warfare would describe a nightmare of earth and mud. As rain and artillery fell upon the battlefield and the trenches surrounding it, all World War I soldiers had for their surroundings were barbed wire, rats, lice, and endless mud. It should be said, despite the sensorial traumatizing accounts brought to notoriety, no single trench experience was universal. The German forces, for example, had dug deeper and built substantially more comfortable trenches. The experience in the trenches felt and found by the soldiers of World War I tended to be a psychologically disastrous cocktail. Regular, everyday boredom in the overwhelming discomfort, interrupted by bursts of violent adrenal horror. Of all the conditions faced by soldiers in World War I, the most cemented in the public imagination is inarguably trench foot. A silent main character of World War I was the torrential rain across northern France, leaving no man's land and the network of trenches little more than muddy bogs. For the soldiers consigned to these trenches and battlefields for literally weeks on end, the impossible priority became staying dry. Many, many soldiers would succumb to the condition. The skin on their feet would begin to deteriorate, and over time, would develop an infection. Starting with tingling and numbing, advanced trench foot would infect the entire tissue and muscle of the foot, making it an extraordinarily painful experience. The lack of hygiene in the trenches and considerably dirty surroundings meant infections were commonplace. Should trench foot take hold of a soldier, the consequences could reach far and wide. If soldiers' feet were badly enough infected, they would be unable to fight in the war. However, if trench foot developed considerably enough, a soldier's life could be affected long beyond the war. They could lose toes, if not the entire foot. It has been estimated nearly 74,000 British soldiers suffered from trench foot during the war effort. By no means history's first, and what would sadly be far from its last, World War I would engage in outright chemical warfare, namely gas attacks. The usage of gas in the war started with deterrents like tear gas, but would escalate to outright deadly properties like mustard gas, chlorine, and phosgene. So pronounced was the chemical warfare in the Great War, it was colloquially labeled by some the Chemist's War. Gas attacks would cause 1.3 million casualties across the war, though only around 90,000 resulted in death. A bit of cold comfort for you there. The weaponization of gas created specific challenges for those surviving on the front. The gas required learning. Through some no doubt ghastly trial and error, soldiers came to learn that those who stayed put in a gas attack fared much better than those who ran. Lying on the ground in response to a gas attack was soon learned to be deadly, and those who took to standing on a trench parapet would likely survive. Ultimately, unlike so much of World War I weaponry, gas attacks could be counteracted. Chlorine gas, for example, was soluble in water, so soldiers learned to place a damp cloth over their noses and mouths. In time, gas masks would become commonplace in the trenches, and even as the use of gas escalated over the war, it became less effective. 
Lung-destroying and asphyxiating, the threat of gas was, in itself, a fearsome psychological weapon in the war. Entire trenches could be swimming in dread upon the sight of an oncoming gas cloud. Not all of World War I was spent on the front line and fighting for the soldiers. There were other priorities and responsibilities in amongst the war's darkness. In actuality, troops on the front line were to be rotated to give the soldiers as much rest as possible where possible. However, rest and free time were little more than a mirage in total war. Aside from officers exempt, rest from the front line usually meant hard labor supplying and helping those on the front. A rare upside of rest would be that a soldier in World War I could spend much time getting themselves clean. Such an opportunity could be the difference between a soldier continuing in the war or being sent home with trench foot just weeks later. Any clothes could be steam cleaned to rid them of lice, and communal baths were available to the troops away from the front. Cleanliness was second only to letters to and from home in keeping up soldiers' morale. The vitality of this cannot be understated. In the four years of war, the British Army Postal Service dispatched around 2 billion letters. Food, on the other hand, was a welcome fuel to the war effort, if not a wholly enjoyable culinary experience. Rations would be provided, tinned foods and hard biscuits in the majority. Thanks to the trench static warfare of the Great War, this meant food supplies were overall reliable. The food provided to a soldier would give them approaching 4,000 calories for the day. Not amazing in terms of taste, but enough to keep a soldier going. Most rations would be eaten cold. Sometimes, using a tommy cooker to warm up food, soldiers would create their own stew using the tins and biscuits they had available. Each soldier was given an iron ration, some tin beef, biscuits, and some tea and sugar. A ration for last resorts, a ration for when all other supplies were out of sight and long gone. Along with machine gun fire and trench warfare, World War I gave another remarkable first in total war, a battle for the skies. Before World War I, the mix of weaponry and aircraft was a thought left unexplored. It should be stated, at the turn of the 20th century, aviation was a field still in its infancy. In a thought to terrify any modern sensibility, these earliest aircraft were made of wooden frames only covered in canvas. Though the planes would develop and take on arms, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Battle of the Skies produced a loss rate comparable to the trenches. One in four were killed. Though air combat was new, once fighter planes were developed, dogfights were a whole new stanchion in warfare. Pilots who could master the dogfights were known as aces. There would be one ace in particular who any Allied pilot would loathe encountering. Manfred von Richthofen was the ace to beat all aces of World War I. He would be known across European folklore as the Red Baron, and the reputation that preceded him was well and truly earned. Across the course of the Great War, the Red Baron was credited with 80 aerial combat victories. Though his name would become legend through his activity in the skies, von Richthofen actually began his military service on horseback as a cavalryman. Come 1917, so renowned was the Red Baron and his Jagdeschwader I, the unit he led, it was nicknamed the Flying Circus. Von Richthofen's unit had brightly colored aircraft that would disturbingly move from Allied airspace to another. Yeah, and you thought clowns were the only thing to be afraid of from the circus. The Red Baron would be shot down in April 1918, though he would remain a German national hero and a much respected figure from the war beyond. Returning soldiers from the Great War would bring home the darkness of war to the eyes of many and in some remarkable cases, would be met with empathy and ingenuity. Philadelphia-born Anna Coleman Ladd was a noted sculptor in Boston at the birth of World War I. Ladd would dedicate her efforts towards the war by working with the Red Cross. In a streak of using her talents in the best possible direction, the sculptor began constructing prosthetic masks for soldiers disfigured in combat. This was no societal shunning of the disfigured, but an address of a real phenomenon. Machine gun fire and artillery had given facial disfigurement a prevalence never seen before from returning troops. Anna Coleman Ladd's work only developed with Red Cross. She soon started her own studio in Paris, the Studio for Portrait Masks. Alongside numerous talented sculptors and artists, the studio could create realistic constructions using thin sheets of galvanized copper. Having taken a cast of the soldier's face, the mask would then be painted in flesh-colored enamel. 
The painting would be done while the soldier wore the mask, and real hair would be used to recreate suitable facial hair. Such masks would take around a month to be produced. So many had given more than they could imagine stepping into war, with so much of their experience tangled and traumatized by it. A chance for some to reclaim their image was as miraculous as it was invaluable. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.